Welcome to the Innovation Calling Podcast, where we connect creators for the next big thing. We're your hosts, Aaron Greger and Sia Yasso Tornrat. Hey, folks, before we jump into our next episode, want you to join us July 31st at City Central North Dallas. We have Ellen Sundra flying in from Washington, D.C. July 31st, this woman is the VP of America's Systems Engineering at Four Scout. So make sure you check us out on uh, innovationcalling.com, Women in Tech Leadership, or you can sign up on our Eventbrite link. So, Aaron, let's talk about our next guest. Yeah, I love this one. We had Aries Webb Williams, who is from the Service Boutique LLC. She's the founder. She's a podcast host. And she is really actively involved in a community here called ATW. She's really focused on diversity. And she's done so much work there in that community with diversity because we're tech people. We're focused on tech. Sometimes we get into our own little bubbles. And in this episode, we discussed how tech companies can get more diverse. Correct. And, uh, and it intentionally being inclusive. Yes. Right? And I think some, we don't, we just don't think about it and it's a hot button now and it's relevant. Yeah. So whether it's women, whether ethnicities, whether whatever it is, if you are a tech company, I'm going to bet chances are you're not doing everything you can to be inclusive. So this was a really important episode to record. Hope you enjoy it. And without further ado, here is our episode with Aries Webb Williams. All right, welcome to another episode of Innovation Calling. I'm Aaron Greger. And I'm Sia Yasso Tornra. All right, today we are going to approach a very fun and interesting topic, but serious. Aries wants me to make sure it's here, but no, it, all, it is very serious. But we've got Aries Webb Williams here. She is the principal consultant for the Service Boutique. She's uh, uh, on the board of directors of ATW. She's the podcast host of the Scratching and Surviving podcast, plus another podcast to come. She does all things and to be honest, we were all in our podcast studio having one of the most amazing conversations a couple weeks ago. We said, why aren't we recording this? So we asked Aries to come back to have this conversation because we want to talk specifically about diversity. So Aries, thank you so much for joining us. I am so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for coming. And I was recently at a conference you were part of. Um, it was in a, in a, in a tech. In a tech. Yep. Women in Tech Summit. Yes. And I know you really pushed some boundaries in that particular event and you had a whole panel addressing diversity and i think when it comes to innovation i think you know it's great to there's more openness but it's not enough Mm -hmm. so can we first cover really what does inclusion we know we need to be more inclusive what does that even mean what does that mean for a company well just to speak back on that panel and that'll kind of explain a little bit of it um So um, with me being the board of directors at ATW, how I even got involved with them was uh, a woman who uh, is a board member who was a speaker at an event that I was attending, which was a Black Data Processors Association talk they were having. And um, she's a white lady, and she invited me to a fundraiser that ATW was having, their annual fundraiser. So went to visit, um, enjoyed it, had a great time, went to the monthly meeting. Went to the next monthly meeting, kept going because I was like, wow, this program, like the speakers, the education, the networking was awesome. So after a little bit, I started noticing that there were only a couple black women there. And it wasn't like a weird feeling, but it was just like, hmm, that's interesting. You know, I really think that a lot of black women would enjoy being here, you know, and I wonder why people don't know about this because I had never heard of ATW before that invitation. So um, I started poking around and asking some questions. So everyone I saw with the board tag, I would ask, you know, kind of what they're doing about reaching out to other networks, really. And everyone was really welcoming to me doing that. So, so that's the first step, right? Being open to change, you know, yeah. and, and it's not, it wasn't intentional. It wasn't intentional. And that's really what, um, Inclusion is intentional. You got to be intentional. So once um, the president, her name is Marilyn Kibler Cologne, uh, and I sat down for a couple of long conversations where pretty much she's like, I'm down, like, let's do this. And can you help? You know, and I'm like, definitely. And that's the other thing. I think sometimes people will complain about something 
and not be willing to put the work in it's going to take to make the change happen or to really help engage people in that change. So I think that's the first thing. Um, so I went in and just got to work. I just started helping. I'm like, I know people. I think we need to start by figuring out why aren't they here? Do they not know about it? Um, what are ways we can go about that? And one of that was through programs. So if I have a speaker, usually they're bringing their following, right? And so you're going to bring, just like when you're looking for sponsors and different things like that, it's the same concept, right? If I'm my sponsor is Google, I know the kind of people that are going to be there, right? right. Um, so that's the same thing. If I'm saying I want more black women in my events, I need a black woman to come speak. I need a black person. You know, I mean, that's just, it's nothing bad about saying that. Like, I would like more Hispanic women in my programming. So that's one of the things that I'm working on now is saying, I don't have a lot. I'm realizing that I don't have a whole bunch of Hispanic women in tech in my network personally. So I'm trying to engage in that space, right? That's something that I saw as a gap. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that to us a couple of weeks ago and you said, I don't have, you know, Hispanic women in my mm-hmm. network. And I thought back and I sat and I, I was, I'm listening to you because I realized I don't have as much diversity in my own network than I realize. Oh, and I'm in never. tech and I'm a woman in tech and I, I was, just take what is your nationality, that. by the way? I don't. I don't I'm know. American. I mean, you are okay. Your nationality, your <laughs> ethnicity. My ethnicity. My family's from Thailand. Okay. And hey, I went there last year for the first time, and it was beautiful. Oh, we got to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. But but okay. So uh, did you have my cousin for me? No, yeah, uh, <laughs> but it's not just the the ethnicity. It's age too, mm-hmm. and I, and that's one thing that I've noticed with networking groups in general, women groups in, in particular that I've seen in Dallas Fort Worth area mm-hmm. of course it might be different in others I see age gaps too some groups just seem to attract more of a certain demographic than others mm-hmm. and it's fascinating because it's not something that was consciously done I think it sometimes it's the establishment of the organization there might be a reputation of it being uh because of they're more established there might be a little bit longer in the tooth so there's older more consistent members over time but they're not generating new, right? They're just farming. And then there's where there's upstarts that are starting something. And it sounds because they're appealing to that current event. So they're drawing in that other crowd, if you will. Everyone is pulling from their own network. So if I'm older, my network is old. Like a lot of the time, right? Not saying old. First of all, I just turned 40 this year. So I feel like an old hag. I know I'm not, but I just, you know how we do every year. We think we're old. Yeah. Um, But, Younger people are going to draw more younger crowds. You're going to, that's just a natural thing because of who you're around and, and age bracket stuff, right? But if you want to do something fresh and new and the kids are on these phones that, what are these thingamajigs you guys are playing with? You need a kid or someone young who knows this technology to come in and maybe enlighten you. Same thing. My dad, he wants to be up to date on everything that we're doing, has no idea how to use half of the stuff. But my kids teach him how to use technology. That's diversity. That's intentionally seeking out what you're looking for. Outside of your comfort zone, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and I know, like, I had asked you this before, too, because I know my fear is to out and out say it. Is that, like, I feel like sometimes I'm too afraid to say anything because I'm afraid it's the wrong thing. And, I I mean, it's just being 100%. But it's, like, for a speaker, like, and you mentioned it. And I said, do I out and out say, you know what, I need more do I say like you say I need more black people say in my it, network? Say it. <laughs> we are not offended by the word black. Okay. It's usually not us that's offended by it. So if we back up a little bit, and I had kind of recommended that book to you. Yes. Um, in there, she digs so deep and so much about what our American culture. Um, this is a global co- podcast, but in America, our history we have we fight so much to erase our history. We're trying to really erase because we have a really ugly past, yeah. and we don't like to talk about that at all. So, any way that we can kind of avoid saying it, you know, we've gone through these um, evolutions over the years with race, right? And Black people have a special relationship with America that other cultures just don't, and. It's it, it became a system that has affected black people to this day, and it's still affecting us because we're not talking about this stuff. Like, if we start being more open about just talking about it, um, I think that it will change a lot of this. 
So, okay. I, I hear you on the talking about mm-hmm. it. But in this climate, do you feel like when we are trying to communicate, it becomes politicized? Especially on social media platforms. Only because of the current climate. Okay. And who, you know, leadership, it starts at the top. Right. Every company, which you were just talking about as far as like the generations and all that. I used to work for AT&T for a lot of years. And that is a long standing. That company got it down packed. Their system is the system. When I moved to Cisco Systems, it was night and day the way that they run their businesses. AT&T is very, you know, it's a union shop. It's a, you know, it has a whole different type of situation than Cisco was like free. And our mission at the time was like changing how the world lives, works and play. Like we're working from home. We're no one cares if you're not working uh, eight to five. AT&T, clock in, clock out. Where are you at? You're probably not working. You know, like there's some people that work from home and stuff. I'm not saying it's like that for the whole company, but it's a different system that is in place because of the type of businesses that they have. So, yeah, there's things that you just have to when you see something, you have to make those efforts. But if you are politically, socially uh, ostracized for saying certain things or doing certain things, then people aren't going to want to do it anymore. So we don't talk about it because it's not to be talked about because you don't want to be considered a problem or you don't want to be considered a troublemaker by addressing stuff that people just, they don't want to talk about. I mean, could, could you, could it be argued though that uh, as I mean, right now too, in this day and age, there's a lot of, uh, you know, t- to use a term that the kids are using, you know, wokeness mm-hmm. right, of it all. But could there, could it be the pendulum swinging to the point where wokeness is become a car- caricature of what it really intentionally is supposed to be supposed to be do you feel that that there's some there's a real danger in that especially in a business context james baldwin i'm probably going to misquote him but he said something about the more woke basically the more aware you are a black person is in america the more filled with rage you can become because you see the world the way it really is and it hurts Every day. Like we think about this. We think about our race on a consistent basis. Every morning when I wake up, I know I'm a black woman going to do something. I I always think about my race. There are times where how I explain it is as a woman in technology, we're already a minority as a woman, gender wise, period. Um. I, a lady, a girl came to me and asked me on LinkedIn one day, just via messenger, she's a college student about like discrimination in tech. As a woman in tech in the Dallas Fort Worth area, have you ever experienced discrimination? Um, but because of being a woman, and I'm like, I don't have that luxury to tell you what, why I got discriminated against because I have so many levels. That's where the intersectionality part comes in that there's so many layers that I can be discriminated for. I can't pinpoint one. If I can just be out here for the gender cause, that's the easier cause to be out here for. A lot of people are down for gender equity. But as soon as you start talking about racial equity, it's the different. It's not the same people rooting all the time because I can't choose. I got to I got to care about both. So, well, can I because as we talk about inclusion and talk about like. This is just a very interesting topic to me because I'll be honest, to try, to try to sound cool, I'm not as woke as I should be, okay? But I did not sound cool, I understand that. Why are you apologizing for that? I don't Because think I feel like I've hidden under a rock. And I, I feel like, because if you can't see me, I'm white. And I feel like sometimes, like to, to my point before, it's like it's always been a fear. And like going back, so let's say you're a tech company and you, you have a position out there. And it's, and whatever, it's all the same. Can you say, like, it's easy as if I'm filling a speaker stage and say, hey, does anybody know some, Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, people of color? I need some more ethnicity on my stage. I want to have it up there. That's easier to say. But as an employer, can I say, hey, I just got a whole bunch of white people applying for this job. I need some diversity in this. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, how can you say it about gender? Yes. I don't care. Okay. I don't know. So, no, my anecdotal evidence I can add and contribute to this is uh, at my earlier on in my career, I was a hiring manager and I had to hire for 16 positions. 
uh, in the central and the east coast and west coast areas. And my peer was, I had to manage central and east at that time. And I wrote the job description and I got all these resumes and I noticed it was all males responding. I think I had 150 and two were women that responded. So I went up to the HR manager and I said, hey, uh, what's going on here? I go, can you give me some diversity? And I joked with him. I said, come on, Michael, of all people, you're the most, you know, and the word woke wasn't around, but <laughs> he he is gay. So I figured he would understand. Right? I'm like, dude, what's going on here? And he looked at me and he gave me my uh, first eye opener um, about diversity, if you will, is, well, let's look at your job description. I wasn't going to ask about that next. Go ahead. And I said, what do you mean look at my job description? I wrote it. Like, dude, I'm a chick. I should have like tons of women, you know, applying for this job. And apparently he read it. He goes, the words you're using, the way you're writing it. um, It's an entry level inside sales call job. First off, by the way, inbound and some outbound. I mean, it was pretty basic. And uh, no insult to my friends that I hired over the years. But at the time, it was an entry level job. Um, And he goes, yeah, the way you're writing it, it, it. it makes it sound like uh, if you don't have a bachelor's degree, don't even bother applying. If you don't have two years of experience, don't bother applying. If you didn't, you know, get straight A's in college and, you know, magna cum laude, whatever, don't bother applying. And I'm like, but that was not my intention. Right. That's so interesting. Yeah. And yeah. I think that um, and all women struggle with that anyways. Right. We'll be like, oh, I don't have that. So I'm not going to apply. I've done it so many times where I'm just like, I got. 80% of this, and then I'm like, but they say you got to have a this, this, you know, whatever it is, C++ or something that I don't have. Yeah. And I'm like, eh, okay, next job, let me move on for something else. But that's something that we all go through. Now, if you break it down a little further, um, I'm glad you mentioned that because one of the um, other things that I'm involved in is, is a nonprofit called Impact House. And one of the program that I'm working with is called Tech Hire uh, DFW, and we'll be launching it at the end of this year, next year, but we're creating a database and a pipeline of people in technology. So we're partnering with different companies that are training people to be developers and coding, you know, all that stuff, programmers and giving a, giving companies the contacts. So like when you're looking for diverse talent, you know, this is a pool of diverse, the pool is diverse where that you're, that you're coming from. Right. Right. And then obviously job descriptions and all that kind of stuff and education on the other side for for women, for people of color, people who have not don't know that who cares? Don't don't not apply, still apply like you. You have to teach people how that that's something to do. Well, can I ask you that? And I'm curious to see from your point and then to Aries, what did you do to change it to be more inclusive from a male, female standpoint, feminine, masculine? And then to the race standpoint how do i make something more how do i how do i let people know it is more inclusive and that i welcome everybody and but so your question first yeah 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 just if i can add even further uh of the people that 150 that applied two were women Mm -hmm. uh five african-american males and uh the rest were all white males now i thought the way i wrote it was very technical Mm -hmm. uh because uh Quite frankly, at the time, I didn't really want to have to teach someone what a computer looked like and security right. and networking and all that stuff. And so I was like, mm, we're in the we're in Silicon Valley. You know, I should find someone that knows networking background, you know, at least. And the reality is I had to understand and remember this is an entry level job. Your job is to teach people. That is the position. And that's what it is. And you're going to have a um, certain amount of attrition. Or you can have people moving on, like whether they leave on their own or they graduate to the next position or whatever. And I didn't want that. I wanted a permanent employee. And and I had to shift the way I wrote it because I had to understand I was just a, uh, what do you call it, launching pad position. Mm -hmm. But how can you make it more inclusive? Like, how do you make that's That's what I'm really curious about. So the inclusive part, I think, is the pool that you're pulling from. Right. Just like with us, with the speaker thing, right? The network, if I know I don't have... I'm missing something in my network. I need to go find it. I need to go look. Where is that? We have so many organizations around the DFW area that are African-American based professional groups. You got National Black MBAs. You got NABA, which is National Association of Black Accountants. You got the black sports professionals. You got black journalists. You got the black, the color com. I mean, there's, there's 
all the ones that I would have to Google to find, everybody else can do the same exact thing. Like when I moved to Dallas, the first thing I did, um, I was going to UTD for grad school. I didn't know anybody here. I'm from California. Um, <laughs> and I started looking for I had to high five, sorry. social groups to build my network. Yeah. Right. The first group was National Black MBAs. I'm like, okay, I'm getting my MBA right now. And here's some black people, you know, that are professionals. Cool. You know, I feel comfortable here, right? When I walk into a workplace, if I'm the only one there that looks like me, I immediately don't feel comfortable. And you probably aren't as comfortable with me either because you probably don't have a lot of people like me that you interact with. So we don't know each other. We haven't, we already have, that's why I say it's a broader thing than just the company. It is more than, <laughs> It's more than just saying my company, it's a cultural thing, right? right? But you do have to start somewhere. And I think that we have to say, you know what? I'm going to acknowledge that life is different for all of us, right? A white male going into a tech job. I've been at companies, I won't say any of their names, but where you walk in and it's like a straight uh pub or something oh you know it's like they're just like yelling in the halls they're out oh yeah you know all this and i'm sitting at my desk in my professional outfit trying to you know be professional and then people are yelling and making jokes about me being professionally dressed and oh where are you going you're gonna you know like all that and you're like why are you bothering me right now like i just got through and that's the thing we don't know what each other are going through on a daily basis it's just it's just education. It really yeah. boils down to it. Is it education or is it empathy too? Right? I mean, don't you have to not only educate yourself, but that's fine. I can read a book, I can read an encyclopedia all day long and probably feel absolutely nothing to uh connect with connecting the, is key. the story or whatever yeah. I'm reading with. So do do you think that in business we don't teach enough empathy? Not sympathy. I'm not saying I want your, you know, right, 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 pain right, right, or whatever, right. but empathy to say, like, look, I, I see what you're, I see what's going on. Or is it the opposite? Which one? No, empathy. Yeah, is, yeah, I, yeah. I see your pain. <laughs> empathy is the I one where you can yeah. feel with them. Yeah. You're with there them, with them at the mo- in, the in the moment. moment. You don't feel sorry for them, but you feel you with feel, them. Yeah. There oh, so that one of the examples I gave from that book was about the kid with their parent in a grocery store, right? When the white mom with her white daughter sees a black man in the store and the daughter says, uh, look, mom, his skin is brown or black or whatever, right? Pointing at the, at the guy. And the mom's like, shh, 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 don't say that. Oh my God. You know, like all embarrassed and red and, you know, yeah. just like, and what that teaches is there's something wrong. Different. Yep. And at that moment, we need to be, the awareness lets me say, you know what? He is brown. We have so many different colors in our, you know, like just start talking about how many different ethnicities there are and all that kind of stuff. I do it with my boys when they say stuff like, I have two sons. He was running like a girl. What do you mean? I said, what was he doing? Running the fastest? That's my, <laughs> you know, it. that's yeah. my comeback. Yeah. Cause I'm like, what are you trying to say? Right. Cause I'm personally feeling some way about that. Right. And I don't want to raise sons that aren't aware of that, but that's our culture. And I see that because those, same kids, they're not purposely, intentionally doing this or saying something. But if you continue to grow, you're going to be a grown man thinking like that. Right. Right. Well, and, you know, I, I think the biggest hurdle that I mean, even like a cup, like to my point is to it's it's scary to go out there and be like, I don't have enough black, like putting the post on friends. Facebook. Yeah. Like, <laughs> or, you know, I need more diversity in my friends. Like, you're not going to put be, that out there. Can somebody be my token black friend? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> or can no. somebody be my token black applicant? Like, it just no. feels like no. it's like almost, do you know what I'm saying? Ingenuine. Like, yeah. It seems like it's not. How do you go out there to do that without feeling ingenuine? Like, you really are trying, but it looks so forced no. and fake and stupid. Okay. If you have to announce it, I'm looking for my next <laughs> best, my, my best gay but, friend ever. Right, right, right. Like an applicant or so, you know, yeah. to go back to the innovation and yeah. Well, I think that's where businesses need to go to these networking groups and sit down and be a representative yeah. of that organization saying, look, we're hiring. You guys have the background that we're looking for. If anyone's interested in talking to me about the position, please do. I think it's an outreach that businesses need to do versus come to me. I think that traditionally there's so much a, I think it's almost like dating ladies. If the boy is interested, he'll come and talk to me. And yeah. the, but you got to be somewhere. Right? No, <laughs> Where are you going to find you? Noticed. You know yeah. what I mean? But at the same time, uh, the NBA does it. 
the MB, the M, the what is the MB? What's the baseball? Major League Major Baseball, League baseball. MLB, M- M- yeah. MLB, NFL. They have no problem going to scout out their who they want. Right? They right. go to the schools. They see the talent. They're watching the, the same thing. Companies are looking at our LinkedIn profiles. They're looking at mm, you. Look like someone now. If you have someone in those positions that is discriminating, no, you're not going to get any applicants of you know of diverse mm-hmm. backgrounds age, any of that, because I've been places where the hiring, per, the the recruiter isn't the problem. It might be the sales guy that is asking the recruiter to go get them. And then they're like, eh, I don't want any women because they're too much drama. I've literally heard this when I was also the co-person like interviewing and all that. And I was, I would see a sack of men and say, I need some more women. Like, give me something, to, at least to choose from. It's not a token, but give me a pool. Give me a pool to to look at the different things because I don't want a whole office full of the same. Yeah. You know, I want. Can I say something, something controversial? Yes, please. I love it. Because Aaron, I, Aaron and I have had this conversation before. Okay. So I don't have children. I'm female. And uh, I, I feel like because I don't have children, uh, a lot of work is thrown at me and I'm expected to take over. Or if I'm an employer, okay. There's that one. Let's just do that one first. You don't have anything to do. You can do it. That's yeah, what they say, okay. right? And that, and that to me is like, okay, that's not what diversity means, my friend. Okay. <laughs> just because not, not everyone in your group is married and not ch- with children and all that. Um, but okay, I'm going to do the second one. Actually, the second is what I was really thinking about, which is I don't want to hire women because they're going to get pregnant at some point. Mm-hmm. So they do. They get knocked up. They no. do. <laughs> well, I got knocked up twice while I was pr- uh, working. So, you know, Yeah, I keep looking at Aaron, too, because I make fun of her because she used to be part of the no baby crew. And then she done messed that yeah. up. See, twice. Yeah. it changes things. But but yeah, no. But here's the whole thing. It's OK. I'm a business owner and I have a project time sensitive based business. And one of my top talents gets pregnant and has a kid. Mm-hmm. OK, what do you do? And how can that be addressed? And I, I guess the from my perspective, thing. is I have to pick up now. That, okay, so, so someone else chose to procreate. Now I got to pick up the work. You I would, don't think that's fair to me either. You would do it if my pancreas fell out or whatever, something inside my, I got sick and went to, had to go to the hospital for six weeks. Right? I mean, anything can happen to any of your workers at any time. What are you doing for that? Or is there any accommodation for having a, Work isn't the only thing there. Now, I do understand as a business owner, you have to backfill the work. But I think that's a part of the planning. You got nine whole months to figure out who's going to be doing what. We're going to it's a six week plan, six to eight weeks, maybe more or whatever you guys negotiate. But you need to that's actually one that you can plan a lot better than if my liver is damaged or something right. crazy happens, right? That's a great response. I never really been, I never thought yeah. <laughs> your pancreas shop. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of something medical that yeah. like weird <laughs> happens, but, but I mean, I've had all the different sides where I'm the person who was like, oh, I need, I need you to be here, you know, whatever, but I got to figure it out. You know, you got to figure something, you got to figure that out. And a lot of times, especially if you're a full-time worker, there's some benefits that are, Afford it to each person to have, right? Your vacation, your all this stuff. So I think we just need to be better at work life, not balance, but accommodation, I think. Because I get the same thing with having kids. It's like they'll ask me to, hey, want to go out after work and get a beer? I can't. I need to go pick up my kids. So I'm missing out on certain networking things because I got to go pick my kids up or I got to take my son to a baseball game where I got to like, so there's both sides. Cause when I was, I didn't have kids, I used to get the same thing. Well, you can be here. And I'm like, but I don't want to be. So yeah. now you just have a good <laughs> you know? excuse. Yeah. Yeah. Now I can, Oh, sorry. I got to go get the kids. But yeah. Could, so. could it be argued then the most innovative companies are the ones that accommodate the best. I think you're going to miss yes. out on a huge talent pool if you don't, because like even just like, okay, having kids, it's not that I don't work. It's not that I work less. I just work more creatively. Different. Like, yeah, nighttime like, is love exactly. Time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. When kids go to bed, that's a huge time of day. First thing in the morning is a huge time of day. I might be running around more in the middle than the average person, but that doesn't mean you're getting less quality for exactly. me. Exactly. And if companies can accept that, I feel like you do have a better talent pool. And I don't know how you. Yeah. I have an example of that. Um, 
So, like I said, I used to work at AT&T. At the time, I was working in a call center. So, how I moved to Texas was with my director who was opening up a Tier 2 tech support for AT&T U-verse. And I was one of the team leads helping train everybody and all that stuff. So, big leap from California to Texas. But um, we were in a call center environment. So, it was a lot of, like, you got to be here at this time, you know, clock in, clock out type of work. And um, it just so happened that I had... Applied for a job with Cisco Systems and got the job. I was about to leave AT&T. Within that month of me moving over to Cisco, I, my dad had a heart attack. Oh, no. So I'm new in a new job, three weeks, I think. And my dad has a heart attack to where he had to have a surgery, like quadruple bypass. I needed to go back to California. I don't know how long. Like, I'm not even thinking about my job. I'm thinking, like, texting my boss, like, I got to go tomorrow. Like, he's having surgery in the morning. She's like, it's fine. Take your laptop. You can work from there. Four weeks I was in California, but every day I'm at the hospital with my laptop. I have my Skype on my computer. I can make my calls. Like everything was just fine. Life went on. And even when I was pregnant, same thing. I stayed there all the way through having both kids, okay, because I needed that flexibility. And no one gave me hard hard time when I'm like, it's 3 o'clock. Hold on. I'm taking the call from the car because I got to go pick up the kids. Okay, cool. Like, no problem. But when you feel, and it's some, I've had it where you feel really like, uh, now you got people calling in. They're saying they're sick when they're not. They're not giving you their best work because they feel all. It's something about that being over you. It just, my pro- productivity wasn't the best at times when I felt that I wasn't getting support. And so I think you'll get that a lot. I mean, I was going, I was working from like, I think the three o'clock that I picked my son up to like 12 a.m. was usually my actual hours because my boss was like, I don't care what time you work as long as whatever the outcome. Is yeah, it's yeah. like as long as it gets done, I don't care. That's freedom. Yeah. Like that feels really good to have that. Well, and I think too, like I know we're kind of going off on the diversity side, but I think it's super important for people. If you really want to have a great, creative, innovative workforce, understand the power of knowing your most productive time. So for example, for me, you ain't getting anything of any quality between about two 30 and four. It's like this time I start to crash. And a lot of times I'll go work out at that time. Cause I know I'm not getting anything accomplished. So if I had this standard company that was eight to five and I'm just sitting there <laughs> In my in my cubicle, staring at the wall, you're not getting anything from me. But my but but like I'll six a.m. Ooh, I'm on fire. Like if I can get up at six a.m. and work, like I'm just like ideas are I'm happening. I'm not getting up at six a.m. Well, <laughs> but, but to each person is different. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. Innovative, great companies should acknowledge that, yeah. and and some companies do right. Like go take a nap. Go take a nap. Like they have nap rooms. Yeah. I had a company that had that with a big old mm. bean bag in there and yeah. books and stuff. It was like you could turn the lights out. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm still shaking my head because yeah, Erin is a morning person, but she's also a late night person. I'm like Erin stop. Night. I'm like, stop. No she's sleep. like she's messengering me at 11 o'clock at night. I'm like in bed like trying to read play my Candy Crush or something and all of a sudden, "Hey, check this document." I'm like, "Lady, I'm I'm in bed." I'm like, "What?" 11 o'clock. So I don't know when this woman sleeps, but, but if that's how you're geared and maybe that's why at 2 p.m. you crash, but, but if that's the way your, your, your biological clock functions, I think there should be some accounting for that and it shouldn't be marked against you. I think that's why a lot of kids struggle in school too. Yeah. Oh my God. I never put my kids in student school. Yeah. So what do you do? We do homeschool. So are they homeschool? A couple of days a week, and then they I'm go like, wait, hold on. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah we're going schools. Up. You, I do, yeah. So, yeah. How old are you, kids? Six and seven. So they go to school a couple days a week. That? But yeah, but I, but to that state, we we've taught this like standard eight to five is production, and that's what I I never want my kids to learn that. I'm like, go get your stuff done and go have fun and go do something creative and something you enjoy and learn and. And that's where were you when I was growing up? I know. <laughs> no, no, she didn't say no. Trust me, I'm kidding. No. But I mean, no, no, no. I mean, in defense of public schools, because I am a product of it. I am too. I, 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 and me being my personality, I needed that level of discipline. I think school, and to some degree, also teaches discipline, consistency, persistence. But if you had the discipline from the beginning, would you have needed it? 
But like, if that's what you taught school was, so like, you know what I'm saying? Well, okay, I'm not talking about the content of the school. I'm just right. talking about the discipline of being there, like we getting have, up, getting dressed, yeah. getting your yeah. stuff together. Because you do have life to get skills. stuff done on other people's time t- timelines too. That's the other yes. thing too, and it teaches sociology of how to interact with others, which goes back to uh, I was. Now I think about me growing up. I I, I thank you, mom and dad. I grew up in a fairly uh, you know, uh, you know affluent area where predominantly it was either white. Or Asians, and then there was like some some Hispanics, some you know black African American, and that was about it, mm-hmm. right? And then I switched schools to a predominantly Hispanic school, and I was a minority, which was was cool. what was the quality like difference wise? Oh yeah, um, yeah. I, I went from being like uh, well, a they didn't offer like the certain honors classes that I was used to, uh, and I had straight A's, um, and then I got lazy. Not gonna lie, because I wasn't challenged, and hmm. then and then cross back over. Then I cross back over to the uh, the school that was you know the mm-hmm. other school, and uh, I was challenged again. And then I got lazy because I was like, oh man, I don't want to deal with this crap. So I was like a <laughs> procrastinator. But that's the other issues that we're talking about. But, but that but- leads back to what we were just talking about, right? There are there's an awareness that we need to have what's happening in our culture right Right. my kids i have uh, my oldest son is dyslexic so i see life from a different perspective for him with school than my youngest son who's just like he's he get is everything is just working fine you know it's just like right and then with my son i was like what is this like i didn't know anything about dyslexia at an early age i noticed something was a little different he's very smart he's this you know all these things but something's different he needs certain type of accommodations at school so I have to think about that as well. But his life, the way he thinks about things is totally different because of what his challenges are, right? And so I think just being aware, now I'm more concerned. About, I'm aware of this stuff now. Dyslexia everywhere. I see it all now. Like I see it in every different thing because I'm now aware that this is a thing. Never thought about it once before it was in my house, right? So sometimes we just are living our life not thinking and not really knowing that the things that we're doing is affecting others like these te- like the schools you were going to and some other teachers may not even be addressing dyslexic kids issues and they're going through school not even being diagnosed thankfully i have i have my son in a good school that he was diagnosed at an early age but there's other schools maybe the one you were talking about maybe some in other areas that don't have the quality the resources and all that they're not getting diagnosed and they're going through struggling and getting told they're stupid and that just keeps going all the way until we're at work and that's what happened (laughs) to my brother exactly and it's and and it's frustrating though right because i i I hate to say it because you know i'm not knocking any uh, educational professionals but everyone talks to each other oh you're gonna get you know billy or mary next year oh watch out billy or mary does xyz right and the stigma follows for no and it maybe i mean we had a neighbor friend um, where the child, four years old, decided to just whip out his pants and go potty right where he, wherever mm-hmm. he was standing. He's much older now, and, and he's, he's fine. He's normal. But kids do the zaniest things. It shouldn't be a stigma to carry yes. or pinpoint them as, oh, that's you know the kid that wets himself, right? I actually had to go. I, I got into a little heated conversation with a teacher once um, for my nephew because he was living with me at the time. And... Um, he was a ninth grader, and he was causing a little in-class stink, right, with the teacher. And I tell all the teachers in the beginning, like, please come to me. Like, if you have any, I need to know right away because I'm about addressing it right then and there. It's not okay. He knows that I don't think it's okay. Like, we need to make sure we're addressing it right because I know how my child learns, right, How my, what kind of discipline they need to feel, you know, and she wasn't telling me and, and waiting and ended up doing the same thing, going to another teacher telling them. And I found out through another teacher that they had that conversation. And I'm like, don't go to her. Like, why did you go there and not here? You know, but that's something that could, if I didn't know, that could have followed him, you know, instead of us like, like let's deal with this thing, you know. And that's kind of where I'm at with this whole topic is that. Dealing with it is actually, I feel like, the innovative part. People, after I did the the panel I did at Innotech was called Intersectionality, Living on the Intersection. The reason it was titled that was because I didn't want to scare people. 
I can't say black women in tech, you know, blah, blah. Everybody been like, uh uh-uh, you know, and I had to even be strategic with how I presented what I was going to be talking about, how I, the audience that I had, you know, that was the, probably the most diverse women in tech summit we've had in the five years that ATW has been doing it because it was intentional. That whole day from nine to four was intentional. There were Asian, black, like I'm, I was thinking of everything. And like, I'm, I mean, everything I could think of, I'm like, we want it all because I want everybody represented. I want those voices heard and I want everyone's stories to be heard. And I think as a black woman, we are probably the ones with our story least heard. If you go look, just go on some of these. Um, they just did payscale.com, uh, did a study about how black women are making basically, we start out making 13000 less. Um, and it's kind of like median salary type stuff. But if you compare us to a white male, it's like a, a, a median, uh, I think it was a $13,000 starting pay gap. That just grows mm-hmm. over time. Widens. It oh. just gets wider and wider, and, and and actually we become lower and lower. You know, we get lower and lower, and and so um, what's the other one? Uh, 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 who does the other study? Uh, it was like workplace Gartner. Is Gartner, I think. One? There's a couple others, but the pipeline of Black women. You know, we're not getting into management, even the management roles, barely let alone senior level. So you know you're not going to have a black woman CEO. You got one. We got one just the other week. We just got one. Um, but how rare. Well, can we reverse that? Because, sorry, I was just going to like one of the questions we wanted to talk about was h- how can we help to educate? Because, like, to your point, you know, if they're not going in the school or the – Chances are the school is not equipping them with anything. Chances are they feel like crap about, you know, like they're getting teachers who are telling them they're stupid. I mean, it just, there's not to say it's always this way, but the chances are. How do we educate? Because this is what I'm passionate about, too. I've been very clear. I read Lean In and I was like, wait a minute. I can apply for something that I'm not 100% qualified for? People do this? I got into tech i had no idea how to navigate my career i had no idea how to put myself in the ring there's going to be discrimination happening period but i feel like women and i don't know if it's an you know an an ethnic thing too but i felt like i needed somebody to pick me up and say aaron you're the chosen one we choose you instead of me saying no pay attention to me i didn't learn that till i was 40 i really i'm still waiting for that by the way (laughs) no 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 no, 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 no. i think you nailed it all as well as because we've been highlighting this in our women in tech leadership in our conversations it is so critical and i hope of all things if anyone listens find a mentor you it's your responsibility to find a mentor and a sponsor and that may not be the same person and oftentimes it's it's not it's not not not. the same person but but i think as women uh, we are often afraid to ask for help. 100%. And it's not help we're asking for. We're asking for guidance in moments yeah. in time. A mentor isn't meant to drag you along. They're going to help you along. They're almost like a wind flapping, if you will. You still have to make the effort. You still have to make the connections. You still have to do all that. And you, you got to be competent. you got to know the politics, too. There's politics behind it as well. So all of that is very true. I really feel like if I had... The tools at a young, I was, I would, I could probably be a CIO somewhere right now if I had the right tools. I was so ambitious. You still can. What are you talking about? But did you ever believe, okay, but to the point though, I don't, did you ever truly believe in your 20s that you could be a C? Because I never did. I was like, oh, I'm not serious. I didn't know what a CIO was. Okay. Okay. But so my background is I'm from the straight hood. Okay, like whatever you think the ghetto is, that's where I'm from. Okay, Richmond, California, very um, crime, poor, poverty, all that. Like we did not have any money. Nobody in my family looked like they were going to a professional job every day. I had an aunt that worked for the city, so she was the only one. She was like the one in the family, right? And um, at, and then she brought my other aunt in the job, you know, over the years. She's like bringing her in, right? So, she, you know, I'm seeing them helping each other out and stuff like that. But we didn't really have people that were going to a corporate job every day. No one teaching you how to do all that kind of stuff. I wanted to be Claire Huxtable. That was my my uh, 
mentor at the time, <laughs> right? I was like, ooh, I like her. She wears a she wears suits. She wears, has a briefcase. She's telling it like it is. She's smart. Boy, did you, know? you pick the right role model? You of that know show. what I mean? Yeah. I was like, oh, <laughs> I know, show. right? I tell people, I'm like, don't don't cut that show off because I need my Claire Huxtable. But yeah. but Claire was just she had everything that I thought I wanted to be in a woman, right? She looked like me. She, you know, and and over the years, you don't see a lot of people, you know, as for me, I didn't see anybody really looking like me doing stuff that I felt like I was smart enough to do, but didn't know how. Like, how am I going to get out of this? But it took someone telling me, a cousin um, who was doing very well. She was a, a, a second cousin that I had just met that day when I was like 12 years old. House, I still haven't walked in anybody's house that looked as good as hers. It was just beautiful. I had never seen anything like it. And I was like, I want this. That was just my first thing to her. I'm like, I want one of these. Like, I want to live like this. I'm, imagine coming from, you know, down this way and then. I'm like, I want to live in the big house, you know, right? And she was like, you need to go to school. Wait till you're 40 before you have kids and get married. That was her, you know, her rule book for me. And I just knew, okay, go to school. I can handle that, you know. So I'm going to school to get out of here. Every every level that I I reached was, was just exposure, right? It's all about exposure. So for me, I was exposed to someone telling me, go to school. Cool. Go to school. Okay, I'm getting exposed to other kids that are doing other things. Oh, Cool. Go to came here um, because I wanted to be a manager at my job. I was working in a call center, team lead, manager. I didn't think I could be a director. Never thought I could be a director of the call center or something like that. Came to UTD, got my MBA, was in classes with people who were VPs, CEOs, and stuff like that. I was in the executive program, so I was actually one of the younger ones. I was like, what in the, what's a, like, it was a whole new world that got, you know, and so then at the same time, I'm going into Cisco. I'm going to a new job. I had never negotiated. When I left AT&T and went to Cisco, I made a $20,000 increase on accident. That wasn't because I negotiated. I should have. I found out that I was making still less than what I should have been making when I started. But until I read Lean In, I did my first negotiation after I, I read that book. The difference between that is there are other factors when it comes to ethnicity in this space, right? So there's some other little nuances that we have to kind of navigate around. For me, going into the workplace is very different than my regular life. The communication, how we talk at work, how we do these different things is not what I'm doing with my family. Like someone teaching you how to be a worker, how to answer the phones, how to do these. You know, this it's just a whole learning curve that if you don't know who you're bringing in, you have a hard time addressing what you need to address for that person individually in your workplace or fit the culture that you're trying to build in your company. So I, I think for for me, if I'm talking about black women in tech or something like that, I'm going to say we need to have um, be more aware of what our gaps are. Seek out the help and don't wait for other people to come to you because I did think that, oh, they're going to just tell me it's time for promotion. It's time for this. And it's not that way. It's no. the, oh, wait, my, my work should speak for itself. Oh, I'm a hard worker. Yeah. Why, 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 are you, yeah. why are you overlooking me? I, I work 40 out, 50 hours today. What are you talking about? And yeah. that's, that is such a quintessential problem for all of us. I think what you were saying earlier off, off recording was certain demographics, white male, uh, never had that block where I think certain minorities or or genders have experienced that the that ceiling that we don't realize that glass wall is right there that's it's of our own creation if you will or because that you can push it. Yeah you could you could slide it. Exactly. Right? But but it has been there. Right. And I think that's so different is we just gotta let go and drop it and say, look, if you really want to make an impact in your own personal career or for if I'm a business owner and I want to make a real impact on my product solution set to change the world using emerging technologies, I'm going to grab all these different personalities and I'm going to create something amazing. Right. Right. And understanding that there's going to be some challenges within it. It's because there's two sides, right? You got the, the, the company, right? How they're going to look at their business. And I see a lot of the startups doing very well with this. I feel like, when you're trying to get the business done, you're like, I don't care what color you are. If you know how to code or you know how to do these different things that I need done, then I want the best person, you know, to do the job. So we're, everyone is aware of that part, but I think the intentionality of, of being 
bold enough to say, I, as the CEO of this company, here's the message I'm sending to my, you know, the rest of the people in the company. This is our, this is my belief system. This is how we're going to run this company. And if I find out that we're having any issues down the line of this, this, and this, we're not having, like, it's unacceptable. Zero tolerance. If that's not happening, yeah, it's just really hard to, like, push that after a while. You know, you're just kind of like, eh. You yeah. say you want diversity, but we're really not doing it. We're saying, okay, we got diverse people. And then when they come in, we have nothing to help them thrive there. They're, they're not successful. The culture isn't welcoming. There's nothing that encourages them to be productive because they're bogged down with all that every day. Okay, so, okay, we're talking about supportive and uh, celebrating different personalities as they come into the crew and whatnot. Let's be honest here. Women are not exactly known to be the most helpful with other women. Yeah, we are our own worst mm-hmm. enemy. Okay, so yes, we're we talking are. about ethnicity. As oh, yeah. I mean, Aries and I, you know, being minority women, um, I just from a female to female perspective, if we can't even overcome that oh, wow. without yes. any racial, like, forget the the color blind, we, we're gender problem. Like as far as we hate our own, how do you, I feel how do like you think we should do that? I, I don't know. I feel like we're getting better because we're just getting more. We're getting better at it, but it is hard to deal with. And you really can't do anything about somebody else, obviously, right? We can do what we can do for each other. I think the networks that we've been building is positive and just trying to encourage women to do, you know, to help each other. Because what was that uh, quote about? There's a special place in hell for women who don't ha- who don't work with other women or something you like that. Help other women. So like, <laughs> well, there's a special place in hell for a lot of things. I know, right? I think I'm pretty much own half that section, but yes, but yeah. that part of it though, yeah. That's- so yeah, I mean, I've I've had those women in my career that were just evil, nasty. But, but yeah. why is that? Because in my career, I've seen women in in upper management, and and I hate to say it, one universally agreed. Even the clients said it. They called her Ice Queen. In meetings, they're like, are you bringing Ice Queen? I'm like, well, yeah, she wants to thank you for the business. They're like, don't even bother. And it's like, well, what do you say to that, right? And, and also that particular, you know, the, I'm just to give this one, had no female ment- uh, mentees that I'm aware of. All men- she had males that she mentored. And it, and is, is it because of that? individual personality but it's not because there's a lot of similar women in executive management have a cold demeanor at times it just depends if you've seen that little uh i think it was cute uh, was it by pixar or some one of those companies they did a little little skit um uh, animation about women in the workplace right and it's called pearl oh i think it's p they don't spell it like it's p-e-r-l the code it's something the coding language no, I think it's P-U-R-L. Oh. It's something like that, but it's a ball of yarn. It's a pink ball of yarn. It's Pearl. It's They have eyes. Like, it's animation, so you can see. And Pearl comes to work, and it's a bunch of dudes, right? And these are guys, like actual humans, but Pearl is a ball of yarn. Okay, so she comes in. She doesn't feel comfortable. Everything is like, all, they're doing all the guy stuff, and, hey, we're going to go, you know, get beers. And she's like, mm, no. And after a while, she started conforming to fit in right so then you see pearl like with this suit (laughs) like and when they go out the to go out the elevator to go out for drinks or whatever uh, a yellow ball of yarn is in there with her box ready to start and she's looking like and pearl's all like i'm out here with the guys and when when she gets on the elevator and the other girl's looking all sad like i'm here by myself pearl feels bad and finally like comes out like okay let me and what she did was just say i'm trying to make you if i'm not being myself you're not going to be able to be yourself either right at work so we all need to be authentic in our who we are so if we're talking about us individually not the companies be authentically who you are bring your whole self you know to work but but I think the difference in that is if we're penalized for being ourselves at work, then that's what's causing us not to be our whole self. So you got to have an environment that's welcoming to that, right? right. Yeah. Wow, I, agree. I, mean, I know. I want to keep. It's talking. so much though. I'm like I having mean, a I dilemma right now because it's like, <laughs> I feel like we're, I know. we're gonna have to have like like part two, three, four, <laughs> part two, three, four, <laughs> ten, twenty, forty. Because it's so much deeper. You know, it, it, it is. really isn't. That's what I was saying at the at the conference, like. This is just scratching the surface because it's so much to it, which is why 
Um, the other podcast that I'm starting is called the Bold Black Girls Podcast. It's a it's going to be basically we're building a community around for Black women specifically to uh, like support us and um, educate and uh, develop, you know, and learn all these different things that are really needed if you want to be successful and in, in, in corporate as a woman regardless of your ethnicity, you do have to know the political landscape of the corporate world. There is a there is a system that's in place. Yes, we do need to make some changes to the way the system is because a lot of passive aggressiveness there. But I think knowing it is what's going to help you reach those levels, right? So that part is in there. And then, um, so there's a podcast, but there's also events. So we're going to do certain events around the area to uh, address a lot of these different issues for, you know, the black women that are involved in companies that want to support black women and, and this diverse initiative, then those are the people that we want to come to these events to hear this conversation and even listen to podcasts to hear the conversations that are happening that you guys don't know are happening between just us. Right. No. OK, so perfect segue. If somebody wanted to learn more about what you're up to, what you're doing, where where should we send them? Send them to either LinkedIn, Aries Webb Williams. Um I am working on a website literally this week to have all that there because I feel like it's just so much stuff I'm doing. I'm like, I need a central place for all this. So um, LinkedIn is kind of my main place. I am on like Instagram and stuff like that, but um, that's specifically for the podcast. So at Scratching and, Sur- Scratching and Surviving on Instagram, at Scratch Survive on Twitter. I'm getting a little bit better with Twitter, so... But LinkedIn is kind of my main space. So Okay, we'll put a link to that. So cool. anything I have no questions. I, I totally want to keep talking, but I, <laughs> I know. But I Aaron's giving me the face of like, uh girl, this can't be a that 20. time. No. Yeah. Well, yeah. Aries, thank you so much for and like I said, I think we do need to bring back because I know I've learned so much about just the awareness and the understanding of how to approach it and what to say that's not offensive, that actually is good. And so I appreciate I appreciate you being very open because I know I'm naive. Um, and so I know you've said several times it's a safe place. So it's what you safe need to say. place. Well, well safe there's place. a big difference between naive and it, choosing to be ignorant. That's yeah. choosing. Right, right yeah, so. that's the difference. All right. Well, thank you thank so you much. Ladies. We'll have everything on. Great. So I guess it sounds like to me, everyone's looking at me. We're going to wrap up another great episode of the Innovation Calling Podcast. Thanks for joining. Thanks for joining.